All right. Um, I, I want to kind of uh, spend a little. So I'm I'm a statistician. I'm the director of research at Barry Consultants. Uh, I spend a lot of time on basket trials in a lot of different areas. I actually spend less time on epilepsy. So apologies for uh, any terminology mistakes and, and such that I make. Uh, we do have specialists in epilepsy that work on basket trials as well. Um, I want to talk about uh, not the statistical nitty gritty, uh, certainly not the high level on epilepsy. I thought Elaine did a great job on that. I want to talk a bit about the, um, the discussion that you have to have with regulators and kind of the scientific bridge between, you know, imagining uh, the heterogeneous, heterogeneous nature of, of epilepsy versus actually running basket trials and getting them accepted. And so I'll start with this slide here, where suppose we're investigating multiple syndromes. I'm just labeling them A, B, C, D. They could be seizure types, whatever is important for your current setting. Uh, but I've got three different scenarios here. And the real question is, if I wanted to assess the effectiveness of a therapy in syndrome A, which of the following sets of data are the most or least compelling? And so scenario one here would be a situation where we've got our uh, P less than 0.05, barely, um, and then there's no data on anything else. So B, C, and D, we've never investigated. Scenario two, we still have the 0.049, but now in the other three syndromes, we've got non-significant data. Um, so it doesn't seem to work across the board. We've got this one marginally significant result. Um, we might view this as a multiplicity. Um, I think that scenario two is actually less compelling than scenario one. Uh, the other data actually makes you think, yeah, this doesn't seem to be doing much. And then we've got scenario three, where now we're on the other side of the, uh, you know, the proverbial P equal 0.05, but the data is combined with good performance in B, C, and D. And certainly if we're running trials that have 80 to 90% power, um, you know, if we run multiple trials, we're going to miss effective therapies. So I, I'm just going to, I'm going to put out my personal opinion. And, and part of the issue here is, is you can certainly disagree. Uh, that if I had a choice between, you know, if these were three different drugs, I'd want drug three. Even though it's not significant, um, it looks like uh, the data is more compelling to me. And that would apply not just, you know, I've got 0.049 and 0.051 or so close. Uh, that would apply, you know, 0 0.04, 0 0.06. There's, there's a window there where I like the fact that B, C, and D look confirming. Next slide. All right, so if you're having a discussion with regulators, this, you have to be able to make the following scientific argument. You have to be able to say, if you want to run a basket trial, that therapies are more likely to work in multiple syndromes as opposed to a single one. So if I see it work in B, C, and D, I need to think it's more likely it's going to work in A. And there's a flip side to that. If it doesn't work in B, C, and D, it's actually less likely to work in A. It's more likely to just be a dud. Something goes wrong and it just doesn't, doesn't make any difference. Next slide. So, you know, this is kind of the essence of combining information. Um, you can have trials with multiple syndromes that occur in a couple ways. Uh, people often talk about basket trials where they're simultaneously investigating multiple uh, syndromes. Probably the more common situation right now is extending labels, where there you have historical data in other syndromes and you're trying to extend a label into a new area. And so you're combining that historical and current data. Um, these are essentially analyzed the same way. Um, one key issue is anytime the data is historical, you worry about differences in time that might not apply to the basket trial, but essentially these are the same underlying scientific argument. Next slide. 
So if you buy that fundamental assumption, and it, it's important to have this discussion, you need regulatory buy-in, you need to, of course, believe it yourself. Um, if that assumption satisfied, then what that would imply is right now we have this standard that says trials are successful with P less than 0.05. I know there's lots of debate on that, uh, but it, it's, it's not germane here. Um, what you're really saying is that there are equivalently strong evidence bases. You're saying that there is, you could have data in A that is not convincing by itself, but when I combine it with the data from B, C, and D, it is convincing that it works in A. And that's kind of a logical consequence of that assumption where you said, I think it's likely that therapies work in more than one syndrome at a, at a time. And so that says if things are working in B, C, and D, they're more likely to be working in A. And so that says if you get a p-value of say 0.06, that may be more convincing as a total unit, the totality of the evidence, as opposed to p equal 0.049 uh, by A in itself. So I wanna emphasize my goal here uh, certainly society's goal here should not be to lower the standard of evidence. We're trying to say if we buy this assumption, then it has some implications on how we should view data. And of course, the flip side of that is, again, this notion that if it doesn't work in lots of other syndromes, I may be worried I've got a multiplicity and that 0.049 actually isn't so convincing and it's less convincing than it would be by itself. So it works both directions. Next slide. Um, side point here, but I think an important one, uh, in a lot of these discussions, people uh, wanna make kind of simpler trials where they go, okay, suppose I have extra data on B, C, and D. And what I wanna do here for trial A is just let me have a, a, a bigger alpha. So instead of needing P less than 0.05, I want to have P less than 0.10. And then we won't talk about the data in B, C, and D anymore. Just give me a higher alpha. And there are some cases where that might make sense, but there are also lots of cases where that's problematic. Next slide. Um, and so here's an example where we might have data where we're borrowing uh, historical data on a control arm. And the, that prior data says a control rate is say 80%. Um, so lots of trials, the control arms performed about 80%. Um, if I came, if I just said, well, just give me a higher alpha, what I would be inclined to do is suppose I got data that were say 80% control and 85% treatment, as opposed to data that was say 75% control and 80% treatment. And because those are 5% different, uh, I might consider those approximately the same thing. Uh, Eagle-eyed statisticians, there's a little bit of issues with rates versus log odds. Uh, I'm kind of skipping those here, uh, but just talking about the 5% difference. That first choice, the 80% control and 85% treatment, that is a pretty compelling case because I have all this prior data that says the control rate is 80% and this data is consistent with that. On the other hand, the second set, the 75% control and 80% treatment, it's the same 5%. If you just said, give me a higher alpha, then I probably view these two things identically. But in this second case, now it starts to look like, well, you know, what if that 75% is just a random low? And, you know, now it looks like, man, maybe this is, I, I don't think you view these two things equal. There are some doubts in this second case because it's not matching that history. And the ability to detect that kind of matching and make that scientific assessment is part of the reason that you just don't tend to ask for a higher alpha. Um, you want to have statistical models that um, really get at what the, uh, what the agreement is between the external and internal data. 
Next slide. Um, so I, I don't really have time to go into tons of details about modern statistical methods here. I'm trying to just kind of give a big picture. Um, but the goal of all of these methods is to try to assess that kind of consistency. Um, if B, C, and D have our external data that we're bringing into a trial or a basket trial where they're concurrent to, therapy, to syndrome A, um, I'm going to view this as a good case if everything's kind of going in the right direction or most things are going in the right direction, but I value agreement. And when I see disagreement among things, I don't want to trust the models as much. And so usually we use methods that are usually called hierarchical models. Um, and these are methods that di they directly measure this agreement between the data. When the agreement is high, it tries to value that external evidence more because I see consistency. And when I don't see consistency, when syndrome A is very different than B, C, and D, then I would downweight that B, C, and D data more. Um, often these hierarchical models are combined with some clustering approaches, again, trying to detect when syndromes are different. Um, I wanna kind of emphasize this isn't a magic bullet. Uh, these clustering methods, they sound great and they, they do nice things, but they do require enough data. If you wanna see, hey, these syndromes work and those syndromes don't, and these syndromes work half as much, you're gonna need enough data to inform those models. And if you don't have it, they're not gonna be as helpful for you. Next slide. Um, so just to, just to kind of emphasize this point, um, as a statistician, I don't have the answer to this question. So this has to be, you know, sponsor regulatory agreement here on this fundamental assumption. And the reason that you're making this fundamental assumption is that you're willing to bring in data that says, I have data that's not convincing by itself in A. It's close. You know, P equal 0.06, P equal 0.07, but when it's combined with good data from B, C, and D, then it's convincing. It's the equivalent of getting 0.05. Um, if you can agree to that, um, then it makes sense to borrow. If that doesn't make sense in your situation, then you're going to want, you know, A to, to stand on its own. Uh, but this is the kind of discussion that you'll have with regulators. Uh, next slide. I think I'm about done here. Um, so, you know, why do we do this? Probably should have led with this, but I, I wanted to kind of go through the path. Um, there, this is old school statistics. This dates back from the 1950s, uh, where there's lots of theory that says if you're investigating multiple groups, you want to combine them in some way. The, the $10,000 million dollar question, billion dollar question is um, how much do you combine them? Um, and that's subjective. Um, subjective based on clinical input and everything else. So I don't wanna say you make it up, but you need to have a scientific clinical conversation. Um, the efficiency gain for borrowing this information, you do get to reduce sample sizes 20 to 30%. But there are risks. If you're willing to make this assumption, then you're willing to accept data that doesn't stand on its own, but you feel it is sufficient when combined with the others. If this fundamental assumption isn't satisfied, you're going to increase the type one error of your trial. This is a regulatory risk. You'll have a lot of discussion over by how much, what is acceptable. And sponsors should also be aware that there's a flip side to this. If the therapy only works in one group, you're gonna get lower power for that one group. Because again, the model is gonna be a little dismissive of, hey, this hasn't worked in nine syndromes, but it works in the 10th. I'm willing to dismiss this as a multiplicity error. You just tested a lot of things. And so that's gonna lower power. Uh, next slide, if there is one, I'm not sure. Okay, that's what I thought. Um, so let me just kind of summarize there. Um, I, I want to kind of emphasize the partnership that has to take place uh, 
between statisticians, clinicians, and regulators in running these trials. And you know, there's a lengthy discussion about what is the correct assumption, and then there's going to be a technical discussion about how to actually implement uh, that assumption. Um, and I hope we make progress on this. This is going on at FDA right now. Um, certainly, you know, this is not, you know, ask us about a basket trial and then we'll tell you no, that doesn't happen. And also, you know, you're certainly not going to get, well, tell us anything you want to do and we're going to say yes. Um, it's going to be a, a reasoned discussion there. So thank you very much.